Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the Next Real. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. I didn't do my homework. Well, you know what I said. I did. I know what you said. Go ahead. <laughs> no, spoil I'm it. Not it's what we do. I'm not going to spoil it. 10 Cloverfield Lane. Pete did not do his homework. I didn't do it. He's been it's busy. Spring. I was traveling. It was spring break here. I was traveling and do I was vacationing and you're too hard on me. You were I was just too vacationing. Hard. <laughs> I was on the beach. It was so hard. Oh, Andy. so hard on the beach. I don't get to go see a movie. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, it's good. It's actually I I the Oregon people uh, we get in, into we have these neighbors. They moved here from San Diego, and when they say go to the beach, they have a very different different uh, association with beach than we do here. As as now, I like to say natives. We've been here so long, and and the beach is a. You don't really go to the beach. Let me just say this. You don't go to the beach in Oregon. You go to the coast. That's what you do. Because the beach that, implies that you're going to enjoy the sun and the sand, right? You're going to do beach-like things. And here- Tan, swim. Yeah, no, there's none of that. There's none of that. Castles. <laughs> exactly. That you get about, uh, there's about 30 minutes right in the middle of summer where you can do that here. Most of the time- you go for the storms and the clouds and the cool stuff that that happened, the weather that happens on the coast, and it's it's I I really enjoy it. I've come to find it very peaceful, uh, and I'm just hoping we don't get, you know, subducted anytime soon mm. uh, while we're out there. They are oh those tsunami warning signs are going up though. I'll tell you, there are some really. I'll have to post a picture in the show notes. I actually, um, I took a family photo near the latest. Pacific subduction zone sign. Trying to give it a big thumbs up that I at least I know that it's there. <laughs> it's there That's all awesome. over. Yeah. So anyway, it was a good a good week off. That's all, right. all I've well, I did not see I'm glad, the movie. That's all I'm saying. I'm glad you got to enjoy yourself. Yes. On the beach. Yeah. On the on the coast. The coast. On the coast. Sorry. On the coast. Right. Get it right. <laughs> I know. Well, you got to go see Haystack Rock and stuff like that. So we you were, go to the coast to look at rocks in the water. We do, and we actually That's we didn't see Haystack do. this time. We saw uh, we went to to Bandon. If you're familiar with Bandon, Bandon Dunes is a famous uh, golf resort, and there's a famous Bandon Lighthouse. And so it was a great photo weekend. I took a uh, it was a great great trip for just you know personal photography, and I, I feel like I came back with some shots I really like. So it was it was good. Uh, but yeah, Haystack's about uh, many hours north of us where we were. Haystack gotcha. is actually really close. This is, of course, Goonies Rock. It's actually yeah. very close to it. I mean, so I, I can get there in 50 minutes and be touching it, depending on the tide. Wow, that's yeah. exciting. You should you should come. We hang out at the right. Haystack. I, yeah, we should. Go on an adventure. <laughs> go on an See adventure. See if we can find a little old house there and go into some underground caves <laughs> and find a pirate ship. We read all about it. Apparently, the, um, the property owners of Goonies House have... Uh, have called it off. They they apparently were quite open for some time about you know, having people come by, but they are now uh, they've they've gone into the curmudgeonly era of ownership, and now they don't like mm. people coming by and stalking their house. That's like hotels that are reported to have ghosts, and there's yeah. periods of ownership where they're like thrilled by ghost hunters to come. Oh, yeah, come check yeah. it out, and then they then they somebody else buys it, and they're like, nope, yep, no ghost tours. No one talks exactly. about it. We're not ever going to acknowledge it. Yeah, I've been there. Uh, what else do we have to follow up on? Do we have any other? Well, one? oh, we have a, I, we also have a schedule change. So, well, things. before that though, yeah. I have a uh, I I did my homework. I don't even you, remember. You I don't do even remember what your homework was. Well, we talked about last week with Wizard of Oz uh, and the special effects and how it lost to a movie called The Rains King. Oh, we did talk about that. And I was very curious to see this movie because I, I was so thoroughly impressed. I think we both were with yeah. the effects for the time Terrific. in Wizard of Oz. And I and the rains came. It's kind of based on the book. I think it's called The Rains of Ranchapur, which is a fictional town in India. And uh, the movie itself is. Uh, I mean, I I enjoyed it enough. It's uh, there's it's the story, the love affairs in it are a little much for me, but. Uh, the story is about, you know, just this incessant rain that starts up and it won't end and the dam breaks and floods. And it's got really quite an incredible sequence when the waters just flood the town and you see just, you know, the the buildings crumbling and earthquakes and just everything happening. I was actually uh, quite impressed with the effects. And I will say I would probably have voted for that, too, because for the time it was uh, really, really good. It's okay. not like the impossible, but it's, you know, I mean, it's that sort of thing. It's like incredible amounts of water and doing a set like that in 1939. I was uh, unduly impressed. Well done. Yeah. I'm glad we know that. And I don't have to watch it now. And now you don't have to watch it. There's probably just like, <laughs> if you ever feel like it, there's maybe like a 15, 20 minute chunk. That's all you need to That's watch. That's all I need to see. <laughs> is the next reel everybody i'm pete wright and that there is andy nelson hello hello 
and we spoil movies. Uh, tonight on the show, the fourth in our 2016 edition of our Films of 1939 series, with Robert Donat and Greer Garson in Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Overcast, YouTube, or your podcast app of choice. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you thought the only thing that would have made that Mr. Holland fellow better is if he'd been in black and white at Hogwarts, then you're just the sort of pupil right for The Next Reel's Instagram hashtag Pony Prize hashtag Guess the Movie Challenge. And with that, let's send the new kid on over to Professor Stephen Smart's class to check in and see who won and maybe get a slice of cake in return. Hey guys, last week we had another win on Image 1, so congrats to friend of the show, Martin at Mr. Tilkvist on Instagram for your first win of 2016 and you're in the hat for this year's Pony Prize. This week we jump to the 80s with Rain Man from 1988, directed by Barry Levinson and starring Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise. As always, a new challenge starts on Monday, so thanks guys and see you later. So the blot spots have been deteriorating over the last four weeks. Have you noticed this? I think uh, I think old Ben is uh, tired of 1939. <laughs> ben writes, I'm one of those weird people who has always disliked The Wizard of Oz. I originally saw it when I was too young, and it terrified me. Because I was coming from a negative initial reaction, it has been much easier as a grown-up, even though it's not scary at all, to continue disliking it. All those nitpicks that you overlook stand out like glaring plot holes to me. It bugs me that nothing is resolved at the end. Toto is still probably going to die. It irritates me that Glinda sends her on a fool's errand. You wouldn't have believed me is the stupidest phrase ever. She just landed in a munchkin land and saw multiple witches magically appear, so I think she'd believe anything. And it infuriates me that they try to tie it up in a bow as if the moral is that Dorothy needs to realize that home is where the heart is or something like that. That's not why she ran away at all. She was trying to protect her dog. She loved her aunt and uncle and had no reason to want to leave them. Okay, got that out of my system. The visuals are beautiful and the music is catchy and fun, but otherwise there is very little I like about The Wizard of Oz. I actually like Oz the Great and Powerful more. Yes, I recognize that I'm very much in the minority with this opinion. Yes, you are, Ben. Your rank 62, my rank 204. Ouch! Wildly standing in the headwinds against cinema culture. I know, right? There are a lot of people who are blind to <laughs> issues of this film. That's exactly what it is. Anyhow, Andy, it's time. Let's do some trailers. I had such a hard time this week, Andy. Yeah. It was really difficult. There were I had three trailers that I really wanted to do. I settled on one for probably not the best of, of reasons. Uh, I I went with uh, War Dogs, uh, the comedy drama based on a true story, starring Jonah Hill and Miles Teller, and I I did it for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, I I really liked Lord of War. That, oh yeah, it's a good movie. Yeah, that taught me that I like stories about gun runners, and so I did, I thought I don't even need to see the trailer for War Dogs. It's Miles Teller and Jonah Hill, two young actors that I really like right now. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and just go with it. But I watched the trailer anyway, uh, and I found myself really uh, in- enthusiastic. I think it's it just looks like a funny take on this. I also liked the uh, the Hangover Hangover movies. Uh, of course, uh, uh, these are uh, movies from uh, writer director Todd Phillips, as is this one. And so uh, you know, we'll see. It looks. <sighs> I don't know. I get a little bit of an Adam McKay, uh, you know, the big short vibe in this film. Like he's trying to do something a little bit more serious, uh, but still approaching it with a, a, a bit of a comedic vein. And and I laughed at the trailer. I laughed at it. It was it, it looked funny. It looked like a a, a good sort of uh, gun running comedy adventure. I don't know. What'd you think? I actually had a really good time watching the trailer. I thought it looked really fun. Um, I think it speaks to, I mean, it's based on a true story. And I think it speaks to 
um, a lot of people's attitudes about um, the way uh, people like this end up exploiting these situations and these two buffoons and how they end up kind of exploiting the this situation of of uh, basically kind of becoming gun runners for the government. Um, I there is a lot of comedy in that. I think. I mean, it's it's frightening comedy. It's like Wolf of Wall Street sort of comedy. You know, that really kind yeah. of dark satire of the dark places that uh, that uh, humanity can take us. But um, I don't know. It just cracked me up, and uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm very much looking forward to seeing it. Uh, I think this pair, um, they look like they are going to make a great um, on-screen duo. Like the chemistry will be really strong between them. I think so too. And it, you know, the the whole true story aspect. I don't know. I, I don't actually know the story of David Pakush and if from. Diveroli, but the opening gag that they win this government contract for three hundred million dollars uh, when they <laughs> came in under the next the next lowest bid by like fifty three million dollars or fifty right. three uh, million was that it fifty three million dollars something like that yeah. it, it was it's it's a, an obscene amount of money that they were under uh, and and I found that really amusing that that hooked me so well and I think that also gives or it speaks to that whole um that whole idea of kind of the way things are set up to operate and how it may not be um the best and because you know somebody um bids does a, a low ball bid and granted these guys do an unbeknownst low ball bid but then right. these guys tell them how much they lowballed it it's going to put something in their heads that is is going to make these people not their friends and yeah. I think there's there is a danger to the system when it works this way sometimes. Oh, the system is wildly broken. What's yes, what's better is. about that that sequence? I think that the bureaucrat it's the bureaucrat playing twins. It looked like it, it happens yeah. kind of quickly, but it looks like the the guys making the decision are army bureaucrats that are twins. And I find that not not that there's anything wrong with twins, but that the that they would intentionally put two people in charge of this. <laughs> or twins right. in charge of this thing. Just, I find that uh, funny. So it was very funny. It was very I, funny. Yes, I was pleased with it. So uh, I this hits. Uh, when does it hit? It hits in the USA. It hits in August um, of August sixteenth. It looks like August nineteenth. It looks like it opens in the Netherlands first on August eighteenth, and then uh, throughout August and September, um, uh, we've got UK, Germany, France, and Italy uh, through September fifteenth. No other known release dates at this time. Nice. Well, I'm looking forward to that one. What's yours? Mine is, uh, you know, I had a really hard time, uh, maybe for the opposite reasons of you. Um, You had a lot of options that you enjoyed. I couldn't find any option that I was really that excited about (laughs) other than War Dogs. So thanks for taking that one. Yeah, right. But um, uh, so I ended up picking The Invitation. Um, It looks like an interesting film. It's directed by uh, Karen Kusiyama, who um, has done some films like Girl Fight is where she uh, first was kind of discovered, I guess you could say. Then Eon Flux, which was a kind of a big bomb for her. But I will say she certainly still showed some action prowess. I mean, I still thought that film had some fun elements going on in it. Um, Jennifer's Body, which I think kind of bombed at the box office. And now uh, and now this. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of curious about this one. It looks like a little indie sort of film that um looks like it could be really interesting it uh it might not be interesting at all it's, I, I have a hard time telling from the trailer but just here's a here's a plot summary from imdb will and eden were once a loving couple after a tragedy took their son eden disappeared two years later out of the blue she returned with a new husband and as a different person, eerily changed and eager to reunite with her ex and those she left behind. Over the course of a dinner party in the house that was once his, the haunted Will is gripped by mounting evidence that Eden and her new friends have a mysterious and terrifying agenda. But can Will can we trust Will's hold on reality, or will he be the unwitting catalyst of the doom he senses? So I do get. I mean, so you don't get all that out of the trailer, but I do. <laughs> I, I I do get that sense of that psychological paranoia that uh, that sense in the film of is this guy is there something really going to be happening or is this guy just kind of losing his mind because he's hanging out with his ex there's something interesting about that and it definitely piques my curiosity in that sense i i hope that it's something that could work but i i can't quite tell from the trailer so this is one that i i think i would rent down the road and just kind of see if it ended up working or not so what what do you think? 
Yeah, you know, I, you, I predictably, this is not a movie that was made for me. This looked like The Witch in like an IKEA store. It it was <laughs> it, it was looked like everything that was designed to make me not want to see a movie. I so, uh, it, you know, if you forced me, if it was some sort of a guilty pleasure pick, I, I'd watch it. But I it's it's not for me. I the another trailer I watched this weekend that it was uh, what was it Lights Out or Leave the Lights uh-huh. On? Have okay. you seen that one? Yep, yeah, yep. it was that same sort of thing. It's like you know. You you never know when people are just going to start yelling at each other, so uh, and screaming. I, I just have not. Uh, I was not into it. It, it is. Well, it's less horrifying, definitely. It's much well, more of a psychological thriller. And that's moment. what I was going to say because yeah. I think you'd be you'd be safer watching something like this than Lights Out because this one doesn't have that ring of just straight up horror, you know, yeah. slasher sort of thing. This one looks more like it's going to be a psychological uh, thriller. Yeah. Yeah. And to that end, I think that you'd be fine with this one. Well, I probably would. I and to your point, um, you know, girl fight and and Anne Flux too. I I think Anne Flux, beyond being wildly miscast, uh, actually was a was a fun film to watch. I think it was it, it was visually. I think offered a lot to look at. Um, the other thing I'm really excited about, which I have not watched yet, but Karen Kusiyama uh, directed this week's episode of Billions. Uh, are you up on the billions yet? I'm not. Oh my goodness! Billions is a fantastically diabolical series on Showtime, and this week is its tenth uh, episode, uh, and it is fantastic. Uh, uh, it stars uh, Paul Giamatti uh, as the uh, U.S. Uh, District Attorney for New York, and uh, and Damian Lewis as a uh, the head of a massive hedge fund uh, acts capital and they're going against each other uh, in and out of the courts it's awesome and so I you know I'm I'm actually really curious to see how uh, how she takes on this this show because it has a really unique voice and and so I'm excited to watch that too so anyway yeah and that's she's, it. she's does... done an episode of the man in the high castle and yep, Chicago yep. fire so yeah she's keeping busy um and I think, man, I haven't watched all the Men in the High Castle yet either. But this, the thing about Billions is, it's it's it, it's not as um, well. It's not mainstream broadcast television. They have more options right. on Showtime. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it's uh, it's pretty good. Uh, old Giamatti. Woo! Oh yeah, some he's good. some of his best work, his very best work so far. I mean, he's better really than his TV commercials. Well, I do like those commercials. <laughs> 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 Uh, well, anyway, this one this one ap- opens April eighth, both uh, theatrically and streaming. So uh, we'll be able to check it out fairly soon. All right, Andy. Yes. So you're a stinker, right? Hear ye, hear ye, Alexander Wilkett, the town crier. This is Wilkett speaking. The town crier coming with good news to the microphone. This broadcast is a piece of personal testimony. I have just undergone the memorable experience of witnessing the best moving picture I have ever seen. I can testify that no moving picture ever stirred me as deeply as this one. It is called Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Never be afraid, Chips, that you can't do anything you've made up your mind to. As long as you believe in yourself, you can go as far as you dream. Certainly you will be headmaster, if you want to. But I am here only to testify that in my own experience, the most moving of all moving pictures is the one called Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Chips, Andy. Number four in uh, this year's 1939 series is a film directed by Sam Wood based on the book Goodbye, Mr. Chips by James Hilton. Uh, It is the story of an aged, then aging teacher uh, and former headmaster of uh, a boarding school established in 1492. Wow. uh, Who recalls his career and personal life over the decades. Not centuries. He was only there for a part of that time. <laughs> he didn't start. <laughs> he didn't start, he didn't start in when Columbus discovered America. No. Quote, discovered <laughs> quote, America. Quote, yes. Heavy quotes.
This film has quite a pedigree, Andrew. This was voted number 72 on the greatest British film ever list by the British Film Institute. Uh, that's uh, that's pretty good. The British have, have put out a lot of films. So number 72, you've, you've got to think, hey, uh, people like this film. Do you agree? Number 72. So that puts it right between Elizabeth, 1998's film by Shekhar Kapoor, which I love, mm-hmm. and A Room with a View by James Ivory, which I, I, I enjoy quite a bit. Oh, I, I love say that. I love that yes. one. Oh, I do. I I'll, let, I'll let you love you that one. You can love Elizabeth. I will love Room with a View. Oh, there you go. Goodness. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, 70 is Goldfinger, Elizabeth, Goodbye, Mr. Chips, A Room with a View, The Day of the Jackal, The Cruel Sea, Billy Liar, Oliver, Peeping Tom, Far from the Matting Crowd. So all um, of those films are terrific. Going in, you feel like I'm going to, I feel like I'm going to roll the dice and I'm going to come out a winner. Yeah. And, I, you know, I ended up liking this film. I didn't love it. I enjoyed the story. I enjoy this kind of story, though. So I think that made it easy for me. And, um, but in the end, I was like, okay, yeah. And then I, I found that it kind of flitted from my mind rather quickly. I kind of had that same experience, but it was funny. I, I watched it just this afternoon, and I, you know, it's uh, it it maybe is a bit overlong. Uh, it's it comes in just a hair under two full hours, and it tells a long story of his life. They make some really interesting choices about the the pieces of his life that they're going to be talking about, and the pieces they're going to just skip right through. Um, but in the end, I found myself thinking, okay, I maybe I'm I'm not all that moved by it, and you know, it was it was good, it was a good story, and and uh, you know, our major characters were I, I thought served the film really well. And suddenly, uh, the film ends, and I realize I'm like on the edge of tears. I, you know, and I had a moment too where it struck me. And mine wasn't at the end. Mine was actually uh, a little earlier when he's reading the names of the people who have died um, in the war. And it was just it, and that it was the same thing. I mean, I had a lot of ups and downs, kind of like, eh, okay, I'm kind of into it. Okay, I'm kind of losing interest. It just kind of was floated along for me. And sometimes I like I felt the pacing was actually uh, really streamlined, considering it was like you know sixty some years of of storytelling. And then sometimes I'm like, well, it's a little, little sluggish right here. But then I hit that point and it's just like practically, you know, just welling up because of the moment. So I think that's, there's something inherent in a a film like this where it's kind of that, uh, a story, I I saw somebody word it online, a, a, a most memorable person story where you you get connected to this person and you see a lot of ins and outs of their life and and sometimes it's more interesting and sometimes it's a little more boring kind of like life anyway and it, that moment for me hit at this point where you know he's he's reading these names trying to stay strong and uh but he knows all of them and some of them are much more dear to him some of them aren't and it it, it was just a very touching, poignant thing uh, in the film to see. And I don't know, I really kind of connected with that. And I think that's something with why I like these sorts of films that that really kind of uh, uh, tap into that about a person and you really get a good sense of who this person is. Well, a person, but but particularly for me, it's teachers. Teacher stories slay me. And and it's uh, you, whatever you want to say about like Mr. Holland or uh, what was the other one I like so much with Frodo in it? Oh, with Frodo? That's a different one. No, Andy, it's not Elijah Wood. It's Tobey Maguire and Michael Douglas in The Wonder Boys. Oh, yeah, it's one of my top five favorite films. See, what you don't know is that I just cut out a whole lot of the show of us trying to remember who this is. For somebody saying that this is their top five favorite film, you should have come to that sooner and not made me look like a boob. I'm not going to come to that if you're bringing up Elijah Wood. I get Elijah Wood and Tobey Maguire confused, so sue me. Look at him. Tobey Maguire could have been Frodo every bit. I want to cast a movie with the two of them as brothers now. Brother Hobbits. (laughs) Brother Hobbits at a school (laughs) where aliens are the teachers. Established in 1492. Oh, man. Yeah. This is it. Yeah, this is a game changer is what they say in the business. But it's got to somehow we got to write it to last 60 years. Pivot. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, there and back again, Andy. There and back again. <laughs> and again. It's, it's and again, practically and again. writes itself. Uh, anyway, it's this whole thing about professors, like teachers, and I, I, I think uh, maybe we have a, a particularly a particular affinity to to the role. Uh, but those these movies just slay me. I uh, every single time, and and so this one I think is it 
I, I look at it quite fondly. It is a it's a serviceable film. It's long and a touch slow, but I find I um, I connect with the characters in a pleasant way. Right? It it's not over. It, it's not a, an overly emotional kind of connection, but it's 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 pleasant. Uh, there there's nothing I fi- I look at and think even there. <laughs> Their conversation on top of, you know, Everest. <laughs> they, were, they were in Austria, I guess. I think they're in the uh, Alps. <laughs> they're in the Alps. Uh, their their conversation to the Alps when they're on the on top of the mountain. And he and Gergarsen are on top of the mountain, and they and they warm each other in the middle of the Alps by sharing a, a wee jacket. It's it's you know it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous set, uh, but it's a it's a fine little love story chapter of the film. And I didn't find myself uh, looking at that too hard. I just enjoyed these these characters on screen, and that that I think is what this film is all about. So and the trail um, on the mountain looked like the hobbit <laughs> like <laughs> some of the most unsafe trails to be hiking yes, on especially in a fog and I, and I love this sign you know he comes across a sign that's like sticking out of the side of the mountain where there should be no trail and it just says you know in memory of he who was lost here <laughs> that was a good a good bit essentially the blocking we, the trail we we haven't uh we haven't really actually talked about the story and the story is of this english professor Mr. Chipping. Mr. Chipping, uh, who, uh, you know, when we meet him, he is an elderly man. He's in his, his twilight years. And immediately, uh, almost immediately, uh, he, uh, he falls asleep in front of the fire. And the rest of the film essentially is a flashback of his life. And so we get 63 years of his life from the day he arrives or he travels to um, this school and all of the lives that he comes into contact with over the course of his time at the school. Uh, and his career changes from teacher to housemaster uh, to retiree, and then eventually to come back uh, and act as headmaster for so long. And uh, and so that's his that's his story. It was it was pitched to me as a love story, so I went into it expecting it to be much more of a love story. And it turns out the relationship with Greer Garson is a very small part of the film right in the middle. Well, and if you look at the the cover that is offered up to you when you rent it, it's of the dapper young um, Robert Donat um, and Greer Garson, and they look just like you know a wonderful, uh, sexy 1930s couple. There's nothing. I mean, he's yeah. he looks that way in the movie for about like ten minutes, and the rest yes. of the movie he either has a great big uh, bushy mustache or he looks like Einstein. Yes. Yes. Uh, so a, a little bit of uh, misleading marketing on the poster, um, but I, I don't think that ended up hurting my my viewing of it. I think it ended up still being a, a good story about the couple, and I think their their relationship in the film actually, you know, we we have to have it. It has to be short. We have to kind of move through it in order to see how he adjusts to life afterward, uh, and kind of is allowed to really come out of his shell. Yeah, and I think that's a, a strength. I mean, you know, I this is a most memorable person movie, but it is also a life at school movie. And and we definitely get to see a lot of his life at school. I mean, really, I mean, the teachers at this period in time, they live on campus. I mean, it's that they are their job. I mean, essentially that is all they do. And it's very interesting to kind of see that this is kind of how things um were back in the in the 30s. Um, when Hilton wrote his book and when this film was made. I like seeing this character. I mean, despite issues I may have with the film, I really enjoy the character of Mr. Chips. I enjoy seeing him uh, trying to figure out kind of what he's going to do. I mean, at the beginning, he's a mess as a teacher. He's very unsuccessful, and he has a lot to learn. And we get to kind of see him become a better teacher. And then through this uh, relationship that he develops and and, uh, this wife he marries, he ends up becoming uh, kind of changing his direction a little bit. And I thought there was a real strength to that. I mean, there's definitely things that I I think are, um, uh, I think, kind of storytelling um, candy for us to enjoy as far as kind of his perspective um, and don't may not work that well in the world of teaching. But that being said, I really enjoy his character transformation and how it leads him on this journey and how uh, he becomes this person that 
ends up meaning so much to people. And he's that guy that he was jealous of at the beginning, or maybe not jealous of, but he he wished to be that type of person that the the students wanted to go talk to that person and and chat with that that professor. Um, and then at the end of the film, he is that guy. And so I loved seeing that transformation with him. I did too. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly just watching the generations of students that come in and out of his life that he is able to teach. And they make make quite, a, I think, a, an able point of of bringing these young kids in and making a and and reminding us you know you've you have seen this kid before and and in many cases because it's played by the same actor now he has a different name it's a new generation uh but but with Mr. Chippings he has seen all of these people he remembers them all he remembers you know the way their pants fit he remembers oh, that sounds really awful that I just said that but but he uh, he makes a comment about <laughs> how their their pants are too tight uh it, because uh that that makes the war sequence when when England goes to war um uh, that much more sort of um disheartening because he's watching generations of people that he's taught not just a class but but a whole sort of legion of people that he's taught uh, go to war and die um and professors being, and professors too right yeah no, it's very touching, and uh, you know, I thought there was something um, kind of uh, powerful in that moment when he remembers his old friend. Um, I'm blanking on the teacher's name, but uh, uh, the one that Paul Henry played uh, was Max, uh, the German guy, right? The who, Austrian, right? Who the took Austrian. him on his his um, yeah? Uh, who's the one who trip. basically took him on his trip and where he met uh, Catherine. And uh, he ended up having to go uh, serve, but for the other side, and people were commenting, gosh, I can't believe he brought that up because, you know, he's on the other side. He must be, he must be going crazy in his old age or whatever they say. Uh, but there's something really touching about all of that. And just th- that, I, that moment, that's why I got so kind of choked up in that particular moment, because there's just so much when a person is talking about that, whether it's one of the Collie boys who was killed or the two boys who um, fought in the in the yard and then he kind of taught them a lesson and then they were serving side by side i mean there's mm-hmm. so much of that interesting element as kind of people uh grew up and and just those those marks they left on him and the the marks he left on them um uh, and and the marks yes on the institution of the school you know because i, I you know we've we've all probably got those where we you know these teachers who are there um, who are at these institutions, you know, they've been there long before we got there. They will be there long after we, we've gone. But for this snapshot, this was a piece in the film that I thought was was really the most touching, that, you know, when he stands up in the at the front end of the Hogwarts Great Hall, and he says, you know, I, I to me, I remember all of you as these boys, because that's all he gets of them, right? He gets these, just these years of them, and then they're gone. And when they come back, he remembers them, but remembers them as boys. Uh, and and I thought that was just a really touching, uh, touching sequence, and and something I've heard you know my own former teachers reflect too that you know last time I saw you and my entire memory of you is when you were fifteen. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so th- did you look at the book at all by James Hilton? Did you happen? Do you happen to have it on your shelf? I don't. I don't have it on my shelf. If I did, it would have been sitting there unread because I. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't read this one, um, but I did kind of have a, a vague idea of the film. I think I told you um, last time that um, oddly I have the soundtrack to the um, '69 uh, musical remake with Peter O'Toole. I have the soundtrack okay. to that, although I've never seen that one. But at least I've heard the music, so I had a sense as to kind of what the story was through the music. But I didn't really, I didn't know what. Do you it was know? I mean, what about. do you think of the music? And in, I don't want to sidetrack because I watched in in looking around for this film. I watched one track on YouTube from the movie, one musical number, and it was largely terrible. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not my favorite, um, I, but I, I don't hate it. And I think it's one of those things where I've kind of listened to it enough times where I've kind of gotten used to it. It's a weird kind of music. I think they were trying to do something um, non-50s musical with it and doing something a little different. I mean, it was 1969, so they were yeah. they were changing things up a little bit. Uh, this was his 13th book, yeah. James Hilton. Right. I've read nothing book. else of James Hilton. 
I haven't either. Um, I've seen a few adaptations of his other books, um, Lost Horizon, I've seen, which he wrote before this, and Random Harvest, which he wrote after this, and I enjoy those films. Um, this was his first successful book, and I think it was just kind of, it was the story. I think it really drew people to it. I found this great quote, this is about the film, but I think it probably taps into the book and why the book was a success as well. Um, this is by film critic... Um, uh, Philip Horn from the uh, British newspaper, The Telegraph. But why do stories about schools strike such a chord? School is a place of initiations, discoveries, loneliness, sociability, tests, and failures, full of dramatic possibility, where friends are made and betrayed and all too easily enemies, where bullies and victims abound, where rules of appalling artificiality circumscribe our every move, just waiting to be broken, and where a few teachers loom large in our consciousness as ogres or objects of worship. Schools are places of protection from the adult world and prisms for prisons from which we escape into the adult world. They are places where we grow up or fail to. And I thought that, uh, I think that says a lot about this type of story, why Hilton's book was a success, and why people fell for this movie. I think so, and too. Still because do. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Chips is a, is a character, he's the archetype uh, uh, of the right, the teacher, right? Not just the teacher at this particular boarding school, but he serves as the iconic role, uh, who is there to shepherd success of of you know the minds that come afterward. And I think that's something we can generally we are hardwired to tap into uh, and be connected to. This book uh, was uh, such a success that he actually wrote a sequel in 1938 called "To You, Mr. Chips," which uh, and also I have not read. But I did find that one. It's on the, uh, I think it's in the Australian, uh, oh, what is that thing called where they they make those, uh, the Gutenberg. Oh, like, the Gutenberg, Project Gutenberg. Yeah, where the, it's all online. So you can read that book online. We can put that in the show notes. Fantastic. Although you have, to, you have to track down the first book first. <laughs> well, you know, it. The, the first one ends. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> definitive. Pre- predictably. <laughs> right, right. I mean, you read the title and you kind of get where it's going to go. Yep, yep. It's like well, death of a salesman. And this is interesting because the the title, the the front of "To You, Mr. Chips" says a chapter of autobiography and some more stories of Mr. Chips. Oh, so yeah. it's interesting how it's it just basically takes more elements of his life and uh, just gives you more. And I think people were probably clamoring for more at the time. Well, let's talk then a little bit about the adaptation, uh, the adaptation done by three writers uh, credited, R.C. Sheriff, Claudine West, and Eric Mashkiewicz. Uh, w- what's your take on the adaptation? How how well do you think it works? Um, I I think it works pretty well. I mean, I again, I haven't read the book, so I can't speak to the specifics of the adaptation, but I do like the, uh, I think the flashback structure here works well enough for the film. I mean... Sometimes flashback can be a little bit of a cheat. And and here I think it's a little bit, but I think it works in context of the story, seeing the old Mr. Chips fall asleep and then basically kind of remember the whole movie for us um, is awfully handy. Um, was it necessary? Not really. I think you could have done it without it, but, you know, I think it works fine. Um, but I do think, for the most part, I think they really streamlined this story to hit on a lot of really interesting points in his life and kind of move move through it. I loved the uh, the brevity, how he's got that one scene where he goes to talk to the new headmaster who calls him in and wants him to, you know, change his outfit and all this stuff and, and uh, change everything. And he's basically kind of threatens to quit. And then we kind of, you know, jump forward in a huge chunk of time to that guy talking about, uh, you know, how things have been since he's been there, which is now by this point years or whatever. And he talks about how uh, Mr. Chips kind of uh, uh, set him straight, as it were, at the beginning. And it's like that was a really great way to kind of move us through that whole part of the movie without having to dwell on it for a long time. Well, to dwell on it and not create Uh, you know, sort of an artificial antagonist, right? I mean, I just really love that we didn't have this structure of, ugh, there's always the younger manager who comes in and looks like a dolt by making the kind old man do something that that everybody else is against. And that becomes a different story. And it becomes a different story that was perilously close to happening in this film, right? Because he walks out of the office and then all the kids start talking. Oh, did you hear? Did you hear what they asked him to do? They said, take off your robe. And it's a ratty robe. You better retire. You know, and they all did their thing. And you think, okay, this is now it's become an uprising film. This is where the 
all the kids are going to rise up and the faculty are going to rise up against this terrible uh, boss that has come in and, and is forcing change on an institution. And that never happened. Uh, and, and I thought, hey, what, a, what a peaceful way to resolve this, that it's okay to showcase a character in power in a film and, and celebrate the fact that that character gets to change his mind. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was brilliant. I really enjoyed that part. So yeah. I completely agree with everything you just said. Shall we mm-hmm. move on to Sam Wood? <laughs> yes, yes. Sam Let's... Wood is the director. Mm. Goodbye, we've Mr. Talked... Wood. We've talked about him before. Goodbye, Mr. Wood. <laughs> what did we say? I think we we liked what he had done. He directed King's Row, which, of course, we chatted about. And I believe in our Gone with the Wind episode, we mentioned that he uh, is the director who briefly took over for Victor Frem- Fleming when he uh, had his nervous breakdown and had to step away from set for uh, a number of days. And, uh, yeah. And then he's kind of uh, directed a number of Marx Brothers films in his early days. So... Um, I think he does a good job here. I think he, again, paired with the writers, works well at moving the story forward pretty well. Um, Sam Wood was, at one point, the president of the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals. And uh, that was an organization, of course, that uh, you know conservative members of the Hollywood film industry formed in 1944 to defend the industry and the country against commies. So he was one of those guys. He was one of those well, what are you going to do? We did like King's Row. We liked that old uh, Ron Reagan turn. We did. I, yeah. I think we had some good things to say about that. And uh, and end of this too. It is it is a, a well trod film. I don't. Again, I don't see anything in this film that really tells me. Having now watched a couple of others, King's Row specifically, that this is a this is a Sam Wood thing. This I, I think really highlights the in, the the sort of fungibility of directors at the time of many directors at the time. So I you know I don't know I'm not I don't yet feel like I have a portrait of of Sam Wood's artistic identity. No, I don't either. I mean, I do think um, in both cases, I mean Kings Row and this, he he tells a nice story of uh, a number of people kind of progressing through time. And I mean, I, Kings Row is nowhere near the length of this film as far as like kind of the span of time it takes. But I do like the, the swath of people that he's portraying there and just kind of their relationships and everything. So, I mean, I, I like the characters that he brings and I, I do find them all relatively authentic. And then of course there's the Marx brothers ones, <laughs> which they're not really authentic, but they're, you know, clearly he had a good handle on how to work with those, those uh, brothers in those films. Right. Right. Um, and he, I think he bounced around between Paramount and MGM through the 20s and 30s, uh, but generally was one of those guys yep. to jump into production and, and jump back out. I, I think one of the notable roles of this film uh, is the makeup because of the way they age Mr. Chips. I think they did a, a really good job. I, I had seen Robert Donat before in films like The 39 Steps, and I don't think I ever put two and two together because I had seen stills from Goodbye, Mr. Chips, but never of him as a young man, always of him with his Einstein look. And so I don't think I realized it was the same guy. And I was really quite surprised when I was watching it. And I was like, man, they I was really impressed with what they pulled off to age him because, I mean, he was born in 1905. So that means he was, what, 34 at the time they made this film, playing from 25 up to uh what like 82 yeah, like or something 82 83 yeah and i it was i was so con- i was so impressed that i was super confused in this film and i'm with you i'd seen the 39 steps and then i uh, i you know when he did the flashback when he falls asleep as an old man and we see him again as a young man i thought well okay now robert donat's in the film honest to goodness i did not know that he was in age makeup in the beginning i thought that was a different actor it looks like a different actor I mean, it does. I, I was really, I was really pleasantly surprised with the work that uh, it was um, uh, er, 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 Jack Don who did the hair and makeup um, on this, and really just did an amazing job of bringing this guy to life. And you know, you you have to give credit where credit is due. Jack Don definitely did it, but Robert Donat also really brought this character to life. And hair and makeup is one thing, but the actor also has to have a sense as to how to play it. 
and I felt that Donut had a just a really strong uh, personality that he developed with Chips as he kind of went through life and and had his changes, you know, the life pre-Catherine and post-Catherine. Um, it, yeah, to the point where it makes you wonder if he ended up pulling like a, a Christian Bale style kind of machinist <laughs> like weight loss <laughs> program. Like he really looks like a smaller man. Uh, and so to his performance credit, Jack Don, uh, we've actually sort of, but not really talked about Jack Don. He was on Wizard of Oz and Asphalt Jungle, uh, both films that we have talked about on this show. Uh, but with 223 credits, I'll bet it wouldn't take long to find others um, that we've talked about in our series because he's been around. Boy, has he. Yeah, he Just is. Just jacked a... on. Busy boy. He poisoned a lot of people on The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> it was him. Just poisoned them. He did. He actually was the, on, on that particular film, he did, uh, he was the makeup artist for Frank Morgan. All of the characters Frank Morgan played and, and he was the creator of character makeups. Uh, on that film. Nice. That's very nice. cool. All right. So production. This this film came as a package deal, right? When MGM bought this uh, uh, this studio in Britain. It became the British branch of MGM, right? In, yes. In, is that how you understand it? Is that Correct. how I understand that's, it? They that's got how the, I understand it, yeah. Uh, Yank, uh, Yank at Oxford or something, I think. And, uh, and, um, and this film that was both part of the, the production deal. So it's MGM, but it was technically already in production, I believe. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that it's it was one of those things where uh, it was that British division of MGM. I can't remember which film we talked about that on. I feel like it was, uh, was it An- Only Angels Have Wings? I don't know why that's oh, the one that comes to mind. Maybe. As maybe that was, that the, was it. I can't yeah. quite remember, but it was one of the films that we had uh, chatted about and how it ended up uh, getting made there through this whole uh, process and getting made in England and everything. And, Denim and, and, Denim Studios. Yes. That's what it was, yes. Right, right, right. And, and I, I think MGM may have had a little less control. I think that was something that some of the people liked over there, um, even though, I mean, they still sent all their people over and Eddie Maddox was still tracking the money and everything. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I think that they smartly, uh, I mean, they knew this was a British story and it needed to be made there. And I think that they... They found the right place for it. I mean, that's for sure. I mean, the Repton School. Repton School. It was not founded in 1492, rather 1559. Uh, they got their their land and began construction in 1559 at the Repton School in uh, this. Uh, it, it's beautiful. I mean, it is gorgeous. The interiors, I think, are all uh, were all done in, in the Denim Studio lot, but uh, but the exteriors is a school that is still. Uh, in operation today. It really is. I mean, it's Hogwarts. It's awesome. And it's just not to be confused with the uh, the Repton School in Dubai. There's one in Dubai. <laughs> there is one in Dubai. See, these days I'd probably rather go there. <laughs> Would you? Oh, because I bet they they could ski inside. I, yeah, I bet it's warmer, except <laughs> you know, where you're true. skiing inside. That's the truth. <laughs> um, editing uh, done by the good uh, Charles Friend. Who was a Hitchcock guy and then an MGM contract editor? Uh-huh. Um, do you notice anything spectacular about the uh, the way this film was put together? We should talk about the the cinematography too, um, which was um, just go bring these things, Freddie Young. That's right, right. Lawrence uh, of Arabia. So cinematography and it, yes, right. Well, see, and that's an interesting thing because I uh, there was nothing in here that surprised me visually. You know, like we talked about um, um, uh, the the across the stagecoach uh, tire or, or wheel shot. Yeah, right. Uh, that was that was a stunning surprise. This I I didn't find anything that just jumped out at me and said, "Wow, that is a it, it, that's a that's something you need to make note of. You need to get out your sketchbook and start drawing." No, and that was my sense. It it, it felt, uh, but I mean, it, it fit the world, I guess, though. And, and you know, in in my sense, um, I, I wasn't sure what sort of crazy, interesting cinematographic tricks they might be playing in this film. So it, I guess it didn't, uh, it didn't feel like it necessarily needed that. But at the same time, you know, I mean, geez, Young started in 1928, so he'd been working on a lot of films by the time he hit this in 1939. And um, so I had a lot of experience, but I'm, I'm guessing a lot of that stuff. I, I mean, I don't think I've seen any of his early stuff. I'm guessing it's all pretty straightforward. And I think this is. But, you know, all of it, I think, is great training ground for a 
a cinematographer who kind of grows and becomes somebody who is filming things like Lawrence of Arabia, Arabia and Dr. Zhivago. And I mean, geez, even going into James Bond territory with you only live twice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, definitely doing a lot of big and uh, flashier things. Yeah, this is very small. And I think that's one of the things that you get in this film that I think that he does really well, which is the the intimacy of uh, the relationships between these boys and the boys and their teachers. I mean, there are some of the, the, the initial shot where he is, or the initial sequence, I should say, when he's in the, the uh, classroom, he goes into the classroom for the first time and the kids go bananas, right? It's it's big and crazy and, and uh, slapstick. Uh, but as soon as he gets control of those relationships and they start, you know, we start seeing them come to the house for tea and uh, and kind of develop a, a more intimate role in their lives, uh, I, I think we see a little bit of the way the camera changes and impacts that to all the way to the very end where he has, co- or he has tea and cakes with uh, the youngest of the Kali um, kids, right, uh, yep. sitting in front of the fire. And uh, I actually really loved that sequence because of just how long they held on the tea-making ceremony, uh, which I thought was was really beautifully sweet. And, and it was it was better to be able to see them go through that period. You know, I'm, I sit there and ask myself, you know, if, if I feel like the thing is over long, what would I cut? And the, the low-hanging fruit are sequences like this, where you just watching, you're just watching him make tea, uh, and yet, in that sequence, I feel like I needed it. I needed to see him uh, bring that boy into this world, um, you know, in a in such a warm and caring way. I thought that was was really beautifully shot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, uh, there there wasn't a whole lot that stood out, but it was moments like that. And I mean, I, I liked. The moments uh, like where they were reading names and stuff and in kind of that uh, the big school hall and it was just a little darker. And I, I think that they I mean, I think they worked to capture the story in a strong, a strong visual way that didn't um, didn't need to be overt. The uh, they they do a number or a number of sequences that are sort of highlighted by double exposure. Um, you know these crazy fades where it, you know particularly we get a little bit of his life flashing before his eyes that's like exposed on the wall, and and crossfades into that. We do a lot of the the kids uh, sort of some of the montages of kids coming in the doors, naming their names, growing up. Yep. How that how that stuff work for you? You know, I thought it all worked fine. The passage of time element. Um, I, yeah. I thought it was nice finding a way to kind of show that. You know, I, I'm I'm torn because I think we've both said, you know, the the film had some pacing issues. But as I think back and I'm like, gosh, I'm not quite sure exactly what I would cut. Um, yes, you're right. There's that low hanging fruit. But there's something about those moments that kind of add to those elements of fleshing somebody's life out. And so I, I don't know. I feel like I'd be hard pressed to actually figure out what to actually cut from this. I'd have to really watch it again with a fine tooth comb to really start well, picking at things. That's exactly my problem. The only thing I can come back to now is not a cut, but an addition. I mean, we, we you know, let's talk just a little bit about Greer Garson because she's in, in it for not really very long in the scope of the film. Uh, he's He is lamenting the loss of a job. He didn't get a job, uh, a, a promotion to housemaster. They're leaving him as a teacher when he is the next in line for this particular role at the school. And to let off steam over the summer, he joins his uh, friend, Paul Heinrich, uh, who is the um, he's a, a German teacher from Austria to go on a walking tour of Austria and um, you know let off steam and while there uh, fog sets in on a mountaintop and he hears a woman yodeling and he well, goes he to her, her rescue she he hears her saying hello yeah hello, <laughs> hello. it's not even yodeling it's not even a yodel that's that's right <laughs> but to and, him and, it is a cry of distress it's a cry of health right and so he goes up to see her and she's eating sandwiches on on top and and we've already talked about the ridiculousness of the hike that he has to to do to get there uh and they have a, a lovely like, moment i mean really it's like a donald duck cartoon or goofy it <laughs> goofy it's like watching goofy go hiking it is the way, and that is, we should say about the cinematography, the sequences where he's like hanging, where his torso is out of the top of the frame, and all you see are his legs kicking, <laughs> wildly kicking rocks down, trying to scramble up the side of the mountain. It's hysterical and ridiculous, but it, it ends up being a, a sweet 
uh, uh, meeting uh, between these two. And it and ends up... It, go ahead. I was going to say, and it was so easy to fall in love with Greer Garson. Oh, she's delightful. Yes, she is. She's really delightful. So she, um, we meet her and we get to the experience of her on the top of this mountain. And then they come down the mountain and over the next, uh, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, they're in uh, they're in a bit of a chase. She's on a bicycle tour across uh, Europe with one of her friends and he's on this walking tour and they end up finding each other again on the Danube. And we hear the story about how the Danube is only blue uh, if you are in love, but to everybody else, it's it's brown. And uh, that is that ends up being a sweet little bit of script where we see the two gentlemen talking, telling that story, and then we see the women just at, after a long, long <laughs> uh, uh, sort of tracking shot sideways. Uh, we end up coming into the girls who are having their conversation, and she says, "Oh, you know, I, I expected the the Danube to be blue," and she says, "Why, it is blue," Greer Garson says, and it's so sweet. And then everybody's in love with her. Yeah, because it was pretty wonderful. great. Yeah, <laughs> this so, is her first first film. It's crazy, crazy. Yeah, she was great. She she's great, and you know, looking at her filmography, I haven't seen a whole lot uh, more of her. I've seen Random Harvest. I think that is actually it. Mrs. Miniver has always been on my list of films to watch, but I've never gotten around to it. Um, but I mean, geez, she had she had quite a, a busy career after this. But um, you know, I. I don't know. She's easy to love. And I think that as the as the human person to kind of break the uh break Mr. Chipping and turn him into Mr. Chips and and find that element of humanity that he can use to kind of grow and become the person that he will, I, I thought that she was just wonderful for that. She was wonderful. She end, they end up falling in love. She moves in with him at the school and becomes uh, the, the the school school mom, right? And and starts inviting the kids over for cake and tea, and and uh, encourages him to tell more Latin puns, uh, and uh, it gets the kids <laughs> laughing. And he becomes kind of the the that that's what causes him or moves him to become a little bit of the faculty hero. And then she gets pregnant. And dies during childbirth along with the child. We never see them. We don't actually experience the death of uh, uh, at childbirth. It's all seen through the the um, uh, the eyes of the perspective of the house help and and of Mister Chips. And the first thing he does when he finds out his wife and newborn baby died in childbirth is go teach a class on April Fool's Day. Mm. That is heartbreaking. It's a heartbreaking sequence. And again, it's one of those that you that that surprised me how delicately they diffused it in in the sequence. We think that the kids are all going to get away with this great joke and a child comes to the rescue and tells the rest of the boys this is what happened. This is what happened. Lay off and they all they all uh lay off. Yeah. I thought it was just really sweet. It was. It was very uh it was very touching how stuff like that worked. It just showed that you know, you don't have to have these elements of real discordance in a film to to make it work. You can have, you can build to those moments, but then you can find other ways to kind of address them. And I think it can still make for a strong story. Totally agree. So she was in and out of the picture, this Greer Garson, and, and yet she ended up being the, playing that sort of pivotal role that turns, as you say, turns Mr. Chippings into Mr. Chip. And and it's, this, it's the wonderful sort of character that, uh, that, once they're in the film, you can feel their presence even once they're gone. It's like she is so clearly there still, even though she's not ever on screen again after that moment. Right, right. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about uh, Robert Donat already. Yeah, he's he's another one of those guys where it's like looking at his filmography, I'm like, man, I think it may only be uh, you know, this and uh, the 39 steps of his that I've seen. And I, I feel kind of bad about that because he's uh, certainly done uh, a number of things. I mean, it's not as heavy as other people, only 22 credits. I, I guess he did a lot of stage work. But um, uh, I I really enjoy him. And But this is the film that uh, um, really he is known for. Um, well, I think this in 39 Steps, but I think 39 Steps is more just, hey, it's a Hitchcock film. This is like his film. He won a Best Actor Oscar for it, um, which was a, a little controversial at the time because so many people wanted um, uh, Clark Gable or 
or Jimmy Stewart to win. But, uh, you know, he ended up walking away with it, even though he technically didn't walk away with it because he wasn't at the ceremony. I also saw the 39 steps. I would not have been able to tell you that he was in it. Yeah, that's kind of how that film is, right? It's yeah. it's it's a Hitchcock film. I saw film. it because it was a Hitchcock film, right? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think the line that uh, Donut said about his part, he said, as soon as I put the mustache on, I felt the part, even if I did look like a great Airedale come out of a puddle. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true, and it felt really lopsided most of the film. Like it felt like somebody put it on just a little bit sideways. It looked like one of those mustaches that he could kind of. It was almost like a I dream of genie. Like he could wiggle it yeah. back and forth, sort of mustache, and <laughs> cast spells. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, oh, so funny. Uh, he's good. Um, you know, we we've talked about Paul Henrod. Uh, he was. Have we talked about he, him? Well, no, we. I mean, just a few minutes ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. I don't it, think we've ever talked about him in the show. We've never before. talked about him in this show. Now, that is uh, that is true. Uh, he plays the uh, the compatriot. I mean, he plays the, the trusting friend who befriends Mr. Chippings and uh, accompanies him on his spiritual journey. I, I love Paul Henry. I think he's a fantastic actor, although I've seen him in very few things also. But now Voyager, I love. And I think that's on our list of films we're going to be talking about uh, this year. And Casablanca, of course. I Casablanca, mean, he's, right. He's just, uh, he is a, just a, God, he's got a great face. He just works really well in, in the film. And uh, he was in Exorcist 2, <laughs> which I didn't even know. And that <laughs> cracks me up. I'm going to have to watch that now just so I can see him. Uh, anyway, so, and then we have, uh, Terry Kilburn. He plays all of the Collies. I, uh, I, I don't really know much about him, but I thought the whole idea of having Kilburn come in and play, gosh, it was the, it was John Colley and then three different Peter Collies, three different generations <laughs> of Peter Colley. I thought that was just so fun. I loved the idea of having one actor kind of play this same character which really helped kind of connect him to, I mean, connect uh, Chips to uh, his students over time. I thought that was just a brilliant idea. I thought it was really great and really clever. And again, it, it also works against the film a little bit because it's the same guy um, that I, I found myself thinking, God, okay, where are we? Are we doing a flashback in a flashback now? Like, I, I'm not entirely sure where I am in the narrative. And and it was only at the end that I sort of realized that I, I get where all these people are in time. And maybe it's because we just saw Batman versus Superman and they broke that rule that now all I can think about is we must be in an Inception style <laughs> flashback. Which flashback am I in? Yeah. That's kind <laughs> That's of funny. what it felt like. I liked it a lot. I mean, I, I do feel there was an element of um, levity that went along with it that I think helped because in a film like this you want to kind of balance that that comedy with the sentimental and I think having something like that um, aside from just helping kind of connect to a generation as you get the story it, it kind of is funny and it just kind of made it lighten up a bit I think well yeah and that it's not taking itself too seriously Right, exactly. Uh, which I thought was really nice. Uh, Richard Adensell did the music. Is this yeah. a score that you uh, you wanted to make sure you had in your collection? Uh, no, I didn't run out to go get this one. I mean, I thought it was fine. I, I guess I didn't think too much of it. I don't know. It didn't strike me. It didn't. It didn't leave me one way or the other. I mean, I, I think that you know he kind of wrote this school song that you hear throughout the film, and I, you know I think mm -hmm. it works well to kind of connect it in that way. But it didn't didn't wow me or anything. I think it's a, uh, you know, that that school song is only of note because they make it of note in the in the thing. They actually call it out in the script. There was nothing in here that felt like the music was a part of the of the thing. There was no particular Mr. Chips theme that stuck to me that that really helped me identify who this guy is. But I will say, I didn't hear any other uh, like old show tunes or anything like we've been no. hearing in so many films. So right, it's interesting. That's a relief. Yeah, so it's interesting to kind of see, oh, this is a film with an actual original score. Adensel, I it was a name that was new to me, uh, but he's uh he's got a number of credits, uh, including geez, uh, Christmas Carol, Prince and the Showgirl, Blythe Spirit, the um, adaptation of the Noel Coward. Yeah, he's, he's 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 got a lot of stuff. Done a lot of stuff. Nothing that uh, I'm familiar with. So it's uh, yeah. um, uh, well under Capricorn, I guess I've seen that in uh, one of Hitchcock's lesser films. Mm -hmm. 
um, that may be the only film of his other than this that I've actually seen now. So there you go. Well, we already talked about the fact that this was voted 72nd greatest British film ever uh, by uh, BFI. What else is it known for? Well, this film uh, was one of the uh, popular ones in 1939. It did get nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Actress, Best uh, Screenplay Writing, Best Film Editing, and Best Sound Recording. So, I mean, walked away with seven nominations, although Gone with the Wind won all of those except for uh, Best Sound Recording, which went to When Tomorrow Comes, and, of course, Best Actor, which, like I said, was a little bit of a surprise to um, quite a number of people because they really felt that it was either going to be Clark Gable or Jimmy Stewart. And Gable actually went to the award. I didn't know this, and we haven't talked about this at all in any of our 1939 episodes yet. But um, apparently at the time, the uh, Price Waterhouse uh, would give the winners to like the the newspapers and they would say okay but you can't publish any of this until such and such time um, (laughs) because we won't have announced it at the ceremony yet well the la times they leaked the winners before they were supposed to (laughs) and so a a good number of the actors walked into the ceremony already knowing um, if they had won or not clark gable being one of them uh, betty davis being another um, so, but they still went, you know, they went and it was all part of the thing. They just obviously were a little, uh, kind of, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how they felt. I think Olivia de Havilland also, um, I, I hear that she ran into the bathroom, uh, even though she already knew that Hattie McDaniel won for best supporting actress, she ran into the bathroom bawling, um, uh, when they called out <laughs> Hattie's name and, uh, Jeez. she had to go be straightened out. But, um, yeah, uh, so after this, this was the reason that now Price Waterhouse Cooper, does not reveal it to anybody. They are the only people who know the winners and nobody else will know until it is announced on the air. Because you never trust an embargo, kids. That is the lesson. (laughs) Embargoes cannot be trusted. That's right. It may work that one time, but then after that, it ruined it for everybody. So, way to go, <laughs> L.A. Times. This is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> it was remade in 1969 with Peter O'Toole and Petula, Petula Clark. Yes. Uh, that's yep. the musical bit. Yep. And then also 1984, a BBC TV miniseries with Ray Marsden and a TV movie um, uh, made for TV for Masterpiece Theater in 2002 with Martin Clunes. I haven't seen any of them. And based on my exploration of the music uh, and that scene of the 1969, I'm probably not in a big hurry. You know, I think that um, Greer Garson, uh, she wasn't, there was really no chance that she was going to uh, get Best Actress. When you're up against Vivian Lee and Betty Davis in this particular year, there's really no chance. Um, I but, honestly but felt for, like... Up against these people... And and you were in you were a great performance in a film that you were in for like twenty minutes. Well, and that's my point. I feel that I mean, yes, she's she's uh, ostensibly the only actress in the film, so may as well call her best actress. But I really right. feel with a part that that's that small, it's like it almost feels like a supporting part. And if she was supporting, would she have walked away with an award that night? I don't know, oh, but it's interesting to think about. Uh, with all that said and done, how did it do? This film, um, you know, thanks again to Eddie Mannix for tracking all this information for me. Um, it did okay for itself. It cost about uh, one million to make, which is about seventeen and a half million in today's dollars. Not too bad with a, a prints and advertising budget of uh, just under nine hundred thousand. So all told, adjusted, this film ended up costing about thirty-two and a half million to make. Um, this film ended up grossing uh, here in the U.S. and Canada about uh, 1.7 million and about 1.5 million internationally. So all told, it grossed adjusted about 54 and a half million. So this film ended up making an adjusted profit per finished minute of uh, about two hundred thousand dollars. So it did it did pretty good on our list of 1939 films that we have talked about so far on this show. It's actually fourth. Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington are all in front of it. And of course, uh, a few of them we don't have any financials on, so they may have been better, but it's hard to say. Roaring Twenties and Only Angels Have Wings are still kind of uh, mysteries. So when you take out the fact that it's it was made in 1939, where, adjusted, where is it on our list? 138. Really, it's it's didn't crack the top half. 
did not crack the top half. It definitely didn't. It's a smack dab uh, uh, between the bad seed and Ninochka. Auspicious coupling. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's right. uh, it did better than Big Fish <laughs> in the uh, profit per finish, adjusted profit per finish minute. It's always too soon. <laughs> Sorry. Just for the, there is a, it's always too soon. It will always, always? be too soon. Always. Forever. It will oh, always be too soon. Come on. I'm calling John August. Head over to flickchart.com and uh, you uh, go ahead and get your yellow stack of post-its and flip through to your the new account that you created a, a few weeks ago that is your name plus asterisk plus 1939 films of the next reel and then the password, which is soup, and log in with that because wow. that's the one you want to use. That's scary. Uh, and log in with that because that's what you're going to want to do. You're going to want to do a little search for Goodbye Mr. Chips and get ready to start raking. And uh, that first pairing, Filmo a Filmo, Goodbye Mr. Chips versus... Filmo a Filmo. We're going to look at Goodbye Mr. Chips or this is... this. Uh, we, we knew this was coming, Pete. It's right in the middle. Stagecoach. Uh, goodbye Mr. Chips. Definitely Goodbye Mr. Chips. Yeah. Or Totzins, Mr. Chips, as the poster says. Goodbye, Mr. Chips, or Boogie Nights. Boogie Nights. I've got to go Boogie Nights. Goodbye, Mr. Chips, or The Killing. I'm going to do The Killing. The Killing. Nice. Yeah. Goodbye, Mr. Chips, or The Born Identity. Born Identity. A little bit of Born. Yes, indeed. Goodbye, Mr. Chips. I wonder if this is going to bump Stagecoach out. I know already. <laughs> yeah. Goodbye, Mr. Chips or Viridiana. Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Yeah, I'm going to say goodbye, Mr. Chips. Goodbye, Mr. Chips or The Departed. Um, I'm The Departed. Despite my issues with that film and my love for Infernal Affairs, I still, I still do enjoy that one. And it's going to be one that I would find myself returning to more often. I think if I were sitting down with them side by side, I would probably put on Mis- Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Yeah? Yeah. It makes me feel better. And it doesn't have the same problems that I had with The Departed. <laughs> okay. I was well, kind of mad at The Departed. And if I have to sit down and watch, would I rather watch Donut or Wahlberg? Wow, yeah. You did hate that Wahlberg. My goodness, Andy. <laughs> I'm full PTSD on that. You are. You really are. Well, let's uh, let's take it let's to the roll map it. then. Here we go. All right. One, one two, two, three. three paper. Scissors. God. Sorry. I, you'd think I should know. <laughs> I um, wonder. We're gonna. I'm gonna go back and put that on a spreadsheet. How many times does Andy <laughs> go scissors on his first? I'll bet it's every time. You're going because I always go paper. That's awesome. Oh, I'm that's so really funny. Well, goodbye, Mr. Chips, or uh, high noon. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Chips. Yeah, goodbye, Mr. Chips, for sure. And uh, there we are, Pete, number 107. So I wonder what that does to uh, push the push the, the what the new blocker is. Well, it, it depends on, uh, you know, it's kind of the yin and yang. If, if we drop something below Stagecoach next time, then Stagecoach will stay there. If we keep adding to the top half, then Stagecoach will slowly get pushed down. Okay. We'll be All back right. to uh, uh, the uh, uh, O Brother block. Oh, the O Brother block, yeah, mm-hmm. legendary O Brother block. Okay, so Andy, uh, it was a good film, but did it crack the elusive five star for you? <laughs> I say elusive. <laughs> you're you're kind of actually kind of easy. I am pretty easy on movies, but <laughs> this one you're achieved eight. This one I didn't give five stars, but I gave it three and a half stars. There you go. Yeah, All it's, right. It's See, a, I buy three and a half stars. It's a movie That's I like. Actually, where I am. Yeah, it's it's a movie I liked. It's not a movie I loved, but uh, but I liked it well enough, and it still touched me. It moved me in in all the right ways, <laughs> <laughs> as it did for me as well. And I actually came in right at three and a half stars for me, which feels like slightly uh, slightly weighted in the happy direction. Uh, and I do that for the mustache, um, but uh, <laughs> but it's it, it's a middling film that I look forward to actually watching again down the road. I'm not gonna you know binge on it, but I did enjoy it, and I will see this film again. Well, this was and, a film and I, I watched. actually think that people should see this film. I think it's a film that uh, there are enough people I've talked to this week that we're doing this film, and they say, "Oh, I haven't seen that." Well, you should see that. See this film; it's worth seeing. 
That's my pitch. This was a film I watched, and I said, this will be a, a good film to watch with the kids um, when they're a little older and they can appreciate something like this, and as they're kind of reflecting on their life in school. Yes, and how this is what it could have been. I could have sent you to a school like this. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we didn't even talk about, geez, like, uh, you know, the... This was the the days of the canings and just like you know, uh, taking a whole class. Oh, you're all gonna stay in detention. And that just, was <laughs> that was my whole that was my whole stunt section. We didn't even talk about that either. <laughs> Reference canings right. when they, <laughs> when that old headmaster says everybody reported a line in front of my office in alphabetical order <laughs> and enter my office every three minutes. Oh That's my goodness! Fantastic. <laughs> oh my goodness. Those were the days. <laughs> Those were the days. Why can't this, we have this back? <laughs> this was the penultimate film of our series here, of our 1939 series, and then we're done. But before we, we close it up, we're doing one last film. Where do we go from here? Yeah, our last film in the 1939 series. And then I guess we'll have to discuss if we want to revisit 1939 or not after uh, after this one. But uh, yeah, we're going to be finishing this out with uh, none other than Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Hound of the Baskervilles. Oh, I can't wait for this. I don't I don't really have any rational reason uh, why. I just I do love I do love me some Sherlock Holmes. It's you know, it's a classic Sherlock Holmes story I know nothing about, so I'm actually kind of excited to go into this one and just kind of experience a uh, one of the early Sherlock Holmes films. So you have not have you read it? I know. I've never you read, a, read I've, it. I've never read a Sherlock Holmes book. <gasps> Andy. <laughs> I, you're, I know. You're I've a only, reader. I know you're who a... Sherlock Holmes is, and I've seen young Sherlock Holmes, and I've seen the two versions of Sherlock Holmes with uh, Robert Downey Jr. I oh, think, Andy. I think that's it. <laughs> Andy, Andy. <laughs> this is your new shame. You can get these things for free. Like the I, ebooks are like there I'm is sure no can. excuse, <laughs> Andy. Well, maybe you can uh, continue your James Bond series. Maybe I'll start uh, Sherlock Holmes. Who knows? I uh, I am I'm at, at like eighty four percent of uh, Goldfinger. Mine is curiosity. Yours is great shame. Yes. That's so what, I'll be watching this with great here. shame. Yes. But before that episode, Pete, we yes, are going to have we're that. going to have our next speakeasy. Oh yes, we are. Yes, indeed. That's coming right up. Who is it? Pray tell. It is uh, Australian director and crazy VHS collector, Craig Anderson. <sighs> awesome. Yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, 1978 film, The Silent Partner, which sounds quite exciting. It's got a little Elliot Gould and uh, Christopher Plummer, and uh, I think one of the first appearances of John Candy in the film. I can't wait. I cannot wait to see this film. Uh, that is coming up. Uh, yes, that's coming up just next week. And then uh, then we're back with Hound of the Baskervilles. Looking forward uh, to it. And until then, I think you know I've got to go to bed. Well, there's a fog rolling in, Pete. That means it's the perfect time to head up that mountain with no gear. Maybe I can even find me a damsel in distress. Let's go up from the bottom, Andy. Oh, why don't okay. You, why, don't, why don't you begin? Well, my one star by Sam Koo <laughs> on November 7th, 2014. Um, I don't think Sam knows what uh, the star ranking system means and how it works. One star, Sam Koo says. The hero acted most brilliantly. So did Garson. <laughs> that doesn't sound like I... one star review, Sam. Maybe Sam thought that the it was the white stars that were the good ones. Right. And it not the filled five. in yellow ones. It starts <laughs> with five. <laughs> well, there are not very many uh, one-star reviews, as we discovered, uh, that don't talk about how what a terrible case the DVD is or the Amazon's performance as a supplier. Uh, and there are very few two stars, one of them that talks about the stupidness of DVDs, and one that brings something up that we did not talk about. And so I hate, you know I hate to get all substantive in this post-credits uh, sequence, Andy. 
but I think mm-hmm. we have to. Yes. By Radad Indy, uh, who says, Pacifism, 1939. I'm surprised that most of the reviews don't mention the pacifist theme of the film. The film is well done and quite watchable on its own terms, but those terms are so tragically wrong, pacifism in 1939, that it's tough to get past the unintended sadness and irony. For a movie that's aged better, see Mrs. Miniver. Uh, we didn't talk about the pacifist themes uh, theme at work in the film, but um, specifically, I think we brought up the sequences that really highlight it. We brought up the sequences that highlight the just the acts of violence and the acceptance of violence and bullying in the film, and how those things are are touched on by the um, by by the film itself. But you know, this is also in its own way a war movie, uh, and their uh, approach to the war, their touch to the war, I think, is um, is really representative of of uh, a different uh, a different take on the times. Yeah, it's uh, there's something about the uh, look at uh, war from the people who don't go and serve, and it's just it really just like the people who serve and uh, come back uh, as as heroes, or the people who don't come back and are are. Uh, referenced in the the reading of the names. So there's something interesting about that, yeah. And the people who don't go and live with the shame of not going. Even our protagonist who says, you know, I didn't go because I'm just too old. Right. Uh, and, And but I would have gone if I could. And that's not something you expect because of the way the film sort of handles the act of violence and the readings of the names and that, that I think it's a, it's really interesting the way they did it. Um, and, and finally the scene we didn't talk about was the, the, the wonderful, uh, experience of Mr. Chips, uh, you know, reading to the kids during a bombing run, um, at not late one night. I think that was a, a terrific sequence of him trying to get through that. So I think it's an interesting, it's a really interesting to film film to watch through that lens. And so when you go watch this film, people, Think about pacifism and this theme of pacifism in, in 1939. It's an interesting take. Thanks, Amazon. Well done. It is hard to believe we have been having in-depth conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. Season 5 had some great adaptations, like our Meryl Streep Oscar-nominated performances series. We covered adaptations like Kramer vs. Kramer, Sophie's Choice, and The French Lieutenant's Woman. It's a real Sophie's Choice between those books. You see what I see what I did there? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's quite at the level of a real Sophie's Choice. We also did Snowpiercer for our Bong Joon-ho series, adapted from the French graphic novel Le Transpersonnage. Man, I love that movie. We had our two-part 1939 series that included adaptations like Gone with the Wind, The Nachka, The Women, and The Hound of the Baskervilles. A number of those 1939 movies, like Goodbye, Mr. Chips, also tied into our recent 1940 Academy Award Best Picture nominee series. Our naughty children horror series had creepy adaptations like The Bad Seed, Village of the Damned, The Innocents, and Children of the Corn. For our Hayao Miyazaki series, we talked about his take on Lupin the Third with The Castle of Cagliostro, plus his own The Wind Rises. Some great listener choice picks, too. Viridiana and The Great Escape. And for our David Mamet Wright series, The Verdict, The Untouchables, and Glengarry Glen Ross. Plus, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang from our Shane Black series adapted from Brett Halliday's novel, Bodies Are Where You Find Them. Dive into the sources for all of these at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support the show. Check out thenextreel.com slash originals today and find your next read.